Philadelphia, one of the nation's oldest cities. Today it is the hub of an area serving four million people. In and around the nation's most historic shrine, many important pages of our history were written. And now a new chapter is being added of a revolution in architecture and planning that is destined to exert an influence on the future of cities. Until recently, Philadelphia suffered the problem of most of our major cities. Through the years, rhythmic waves of expansion and succession had created areas of blight which gnawed deep into its metropolitan foundations. The striking revitalization of Philadelphia within the past decade is impressive and is significant for other major cities. For this remarkable renewal of Philadelphia has been a group effort accomplished within the framework of a conventional type of American municipal government. In an unprecedented liaison, architects and planners Business and civic leaders have joined with responsible government officials in a combined effort toward a common goal. To present the resolution of this total effort and define its principal strength is a man who has played a leading role in this resurgence, the executive director of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission and member of the American Institute of Architects, Edmund N. Bacon. The redevelopment of a significant part of a city presents an entirely different problem from that of designing an individual building or group of buildings. Here we must think in terms of a total design concept. We must relate to an overall design structure. We have found in our work in rebuilding Philadelphia that a central design idea, well developed and clearly expressed, can of itself become a major creative force and can make more meaningful the work of individual architects in various parts of an area. To illustrate the power of a design idea to influence the subsequent form of the city, I would like to take you back into history for a few minutes to the work of Pope Sixtus V in the rebuilding of Rome. This is the first time in history, I believe, that a comprehensive attempt was made at this scale to revamp an old city in total design terms. Here is Rome as Sixtus found it when he became Pope in 1585. A jumble of crowded medieval buildings and squares, a city shrunk to a fraction of its former size. Adjacent to it were the ruins of the classical period, and beyond to the old Roman walls stretched a barren waste, punctuated here and there by old monuments and Christian churches. Sixtus realized, in order to transform Rome into a fitting capital of Christendom, he had to think in broad terms. He saw the flow of pilgrims between the seven votive churches, and he conceived the idea of establishing points in space in relation to these churches by the erection of the four obelisks shown in this engraving. He linked them together by great new highways driven across the city, establishing a design structure which was to dominate the development of Rome over the next 200 years. To illustrate the power of the obelisk as a design force, let us look at this old square in front of the Basilica of St. Peter's as Sixtus found it. With rare ingenuity, architect Domenico Fontana carried out Sixtus' orders and placed the obelisk of the Nero Stadium in front of the medieval basilica. We see the beginning of order, but the scene is still dominated by the confusion of the medieval square. 25 years later, Carlo Moderna completed the facade of St. Peter's, and still later, architect Bernini designed the great oval colonnade as a forecourt centered on the obelisk of Sixtus. So in Rome today, the point in space marked by Sixtus is the focal center of one of the greatest compositions in the world. In looking into the source of Sixtus' ideas, I became convinced they were the outgrowth of the discovery of scientific perspective. In this great vision of the ideal city, painted in 1470, you see a three-dimensional representation of this octagonal church, clearly an expression of mass. As you look through this archway, you see the breakthrough, figuratively and literally, the joy in the representation of space by the penetration in depth between the archway and the gate. 
30 years later, in this drawing by architect Bramante, you see the prism of space more firmly defined, extending more deeply into the picture. In the same time pattern, 30 years later, architect Peruzzi portrayed this city scene, the street still receding more deeply into space, but the architectural enframement is chaotic. Finally, 30 years later, you see the full maturity of the idea in this magnificent drawing by architect Salviati. Now the recession of the street is complete. The cross axis is implied in the round buildings. The architectural enframement is disciplined and the design of the building at the end gives the quality to the space of the street. In the design made by Sixtus V for the setting of Santa Maria Maggiore, the obelisk is in place as the focal center of the newly designed Strada Felicia leading to it. And as the years elapsed, its confused medieval design was transformed by Rinaldi to an orderly, broad, baroque facade to meet the scale established by the great Strada Felicia. As we move from this focal point, down the highway designed by Domenico Fontana, we come to the crossing with the old Strada Pia where we travel down to the ancient horse tamer statues in the Piazza Quirinale. Fontana reset these statues to become the focal point in the cross axis. Along Strada Pia from the horse tamers, our view extends to Michelangelo's gate, and we reach the four fountains erected by Sixtus V to mark the crossing of the two streets. From the four fountains, we travel down the Strada Felicia to the towers of Trinita dei Monte, which marks the terminus of this highway. Down from the Trinita Church is a mud bank leading to the boat fountain designed by Bardini's father. This mud bank, over a hundred years later, is replaced by the great Spanish steps built by architect De Sanctis in 1724. Today, we see the full composition further enhanced by the obelisk erected in the 18th century. Down the Via Babuino, we find the obelisk which Sixtus placed in Piazza del Popolo. The obelisk marks the point of convergence of three streets. Eighty years later, these beautiful twin churches were conceived by Carlo Rinaldi to mark the juncture of street and square. We notice the confusion of the design at the left side of the composition but 150 years later, we see this resolution, this beautiful stairway to the Pincio Gardens above, designed by architect Valadier. As we look back over the city of Rome, we realize that each of its parts is dominated by a rich, moving piazza, with the buildings grouped around it, which are controlled and influenced by the points in space marked by the obelisks which Sixtus erected each linked with the other by an organized system of streets, stairways, and vistas. Thus, the entire city of Rome melds into one dynamic design composition, which not only provided the backbone for the transportation system of modern Rome, but also gives form and meaning to the city and great richness to the people who live within it. We should remind ourselves that the Rome, which Sixtus V envisioned, was non-existent at the time of his death. The total visual impact of all of his work up to that time was unimpressive. It took 200 years to arrive at full realization, but the power of his design idea was so great that it dominated the work of a dozen successors and of a hundred architects over decades. Today, the single central power represented in the person of Sixtus V is fragmented into the diversities of the councils, bureaucracies, and commissions which make up our democratic government. Our job is to inject the same design strength into these processes. And so we have found it necessary in our work in rebuilding Philadelphia today to continue to develop design principles capable of influencing future action. We have endeavored to establish a design idea of such potency that it welds the work of individual architects designing in fragmented areas into a cohesive whole. 
Let us demonstrate the evolution of the design structure which underlies downtown Philadelphia today. This will be done by several of the architects who have played major roles in the development of this plan, to which will be added the voices of the civic, business, and political leaders who provide the forces necessary to get the work done. To detail the background which existed at the time of the resurgence in 1951 is Willow Van Molke, chief designer of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. William Penn selected the narrowest portion between the Delaware River and the Schuylkill River as the site of his green country town. Since the terrain is quite flat, it is only logical to develop the site on a geometric pattern. William Penn connected the Schuylkill River and the Delaware River with an east-west axis, which is now Market Street. On the watershed between the two rivers, he established the north-south axis, which is now Broad Street. At the juncture of the two axes, he established a square reserved for future public building. Thus, he created the focus of the plan. The four quadrants received their own centers in the form of green squares. Logan Circle in the northwest, Franklin Square to the northeast, in the southeast, Washington Square, and in the southwest, Rittenhouse Square. In this area in the northwest existed a natural rise which was put to use as a water reservoir to supply the city. Between 1812 and 1822, the Fairmont Water Works were constructed at the foot of this hill. To assure a continued water supply, the city began to acquire the land in the drainage area of the Schuylkill River, upstream from the water works, and established Fairmont Park, now comprising 7,000 acres and extending to within one mile of City Hall. In the later 1800s, City Hall was built in the square which had been reserved for it by William Penn 200 years earlier. Thus, the centrality of the plan was firmly established. City Hall Tower became the focus for distant parts of Philadelphia and remains the dominant landmark today. As a result of the city beautiful movement of the early 1900s, Fairmont Hill attained a new importance as the site of Philadelphia's Art Museum and as a terminal of a new access, the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, connecting Fairmont Park to City Hall setting the stage for the beginning of the 20th century. This grand parkway was conceived as a boulevard to be lined by civic buildings, an idea which was carried out at Logan Circle. The 1920s became a period of rapid building with inadequate planning, while the 1930s brought quiescence and decay. Clearly, what was needed was a period of resurgence. In 1939, a renewed interest in the problems facing Philadelphia was awakened by an aggressive young lawyer. To follow his activities, let us hear from the man himself. Mr. Walter Phillips. About the beginning of the 1940s, Philadelphia seemed to be in trouble. A group of young men just out of law school joined in an effort to achieve a new city charter as a means of reform in Philadelphia and formed the City Policy Committee. Two active members of the American Institute of Architects, Ed Bacon and Oscar Stoneroff, 
led in drafting a proposal for a new city planning commission. Enlisting solid business backing and wide community support, the committee won passage of an ordinance creating a new commission. The people who had fought for the ordinance formed a new organization, the Citizens Council on City Planning. They provided vigorous support for the new city planning commission. To outline the challenge facing the new commission, let us hear from its first chairman, Edward Hopkinson, Jr. The new commission was faced with many problems, from the running out of money in the 1930s to the absence of materials and manpower during the war years. In the eastern center city, we had the Dock Street problem and Independence Mall. The transportation system was in urgent need of improvement. As one step toward resolving our problems, development of the Penn Center area was initiated by the Pennsylvania Railroad. To detail that program for you, here is James M. Sims, chairman of the board of the Pennsylvania Railroad. An agreement between the city and the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1925 set the stage for the Penn Center project construction of Pennsylvania Station at 30th Street and of Suburban Station and Office Building were steps in the plan. When time came to develop the area occupied by Old Broad Street Station and the so-called Chinese Wall, the railroad welcomed the suggestions of the Planning Commission because they reflected the larger plan of the entire Center City area. The present concept of Penn Center resulted from the cooperative efforts of an architectural advisory committee chosen by the railroad. These men, Edmund Bacon, Robert Daly of City Investing Company, New York, and the late George Howe, noted architect, supervised and directed the progress of this project. We considered it a matter of civic responsibility to complete a development which would best serve the long-term interest of both the city of Philadelphia and our own company. When we first began to define our ideas for the development of Penn Center, I looked around for someone to work with. I asked Vincent Kling to join me because I saw in his model for Lankanaw Hospital a demonstrated ability to think in terms of the design interrelationship of several buildings with each other. This area, right at the very heart of the city of Philadelphia, is probably the largest single space to become available in the center of an American city in this century. We have some very powerful forces working on the Penn Center design. Not only do we have two main arterial roadbeds coming in from the west, Market Street and Pennsylvania Boulevard directly north of the project but we had the daily influx via the Pennsylvania Railroad suburban track system of 25 to 30,000 people. And the drop point for both east-west and north-south subway movement with the terminal here. To me, the most important idea in the whole of the Penn Center was the movement of people. The original scheme, which we dreamed up, Ed and I, had a great pedestrian esplanade, 18 feet below the street, open to the sky, and flanked by shops from the railroad concourse right down to the heart of the city. This set the tone of the first scheme and has remained the dominant element as the plan changed. A strong theme can be played back in many keys. In the course of events, the esplanade was lifted up to the street level and we planned four buildings moving east and west, flanking the main pedestrian movement, giving a powerful accent to the design. The terminus at the west end was the transportation center, which I was asked to design by the Pennsylvania Railroad, and a parking terminal for automobiles, which receives vehicles directly at the heart of the city. A certain discipline has enveloped this design consistent use of limestone, rectangular buildings, and repetition of building height. 
This affords a flexibility in the design of this last open block. Uh, at the present time, I am designing a building in this location. which will be counterpoint to the rectilinear movement of these future structures. Despite some modifications in plan, we have maintained the important theme. There are penetrations from the lower pedestrian level through to the sky at three very carefully conceived locations. They flank this movement below the street so that intermittently, you get the break of sunlight and outdoors as you move along the esplanade right through the project. To the east, we can examine the continuity of this plan. An early vision of turning this movement of people into the core of the city was by means of a fountain. As this turning action takes place, both on the surface and below the street level, we have another pedestrian concourse extending north into Rayburn Plaza. The structure which will terminate this movement will be an omnidirectional building. My design for the Municipal Services Building, which is an adjunct to the city governmental headquarters. There is one coherent statement that must be recognized all through this scheme. That is the desire to move people attractively through the core of the city, exposing them to sunlight and sky at carefully chosen intervals, and terminating their movement in the grand concourse of the new Municipal Services Building. And Penn Center is related to a larger design structure. Pennsylvania Boulevard, extending west to 30th Street Station, is now in the process of being lined by apartment buildings. Thank you, Vince. It was in the 1930s that the first proposal was made for a major project in the old city area. It centered around Independence Hall and the historical buildings to the east. The man who succeeded in getting the ear of the civic leaders and who worked out the design for Independence Mall in 1936 is Roy Larson. This is an area graced by some of our most historic structures, loosely clustered around Independence Hall. This is Independence Hall, the old Congress Hall, the old City Hall, and the home of the American Philosophical Society. To the east, the Second Bank of the United States, later to become the old Custom House, and Carpenter's Hall, the setting for the meeting of the first Continental Congress. Here was also the first bank of the United States, the oldest banking building in America, and the old Philadelphia Merchants Exchange. But conditions around these buildings were deplorable. There was no relief from congestion, obsolescence, and fire hazards in the immediate vicinity of these historic buildings. As a part of the study of the area by the Committee on Municipal Improvements of the Philadelphia chapter of the American Institute of Architects, I conceived the plan of 1937, a simple statement with a green area to the north of Independence Hall and a green secondary mall from Independence Square East, connecting with the Second Bank, Carpenter's Hall, and other buildings to the east. The plan was furthered by the formation in 1942 of the Independence Hall Association with Judge Edwin O. Lewis as its president and by the publication of the plan in 1944 by the Fairmount Park Art Association. It was envisioned that this plan would have an impact on the entire old city area. There was a the beginning of a projection to the south on the axis of the Second Bank of the United States. Although the early studies conceived this redevelopment as one project, the federal government undertook the development of the area to the east, and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania 
asked for the privilege of building the mall to the north. The first block provides a setting for Independence Hall and the square. The second block is to contain a large plaza or forum flanked by arcades and decorated with the flags of the 13 original states. The third block is symbolic of the pattern of William Penn's plan for Philadelphia with squares and central features. It consists of tree-lined walkways with a canopy of green leaves overhead. There is the relief of the open squares with fountains, the entire block being designed for strolling and relaxation. Of course, all this remained in the idea stage until a group of people during World War II decided that Philadelphia needed a better vision of what it might become in the post-war period. This was done through the medium of the Better Philadelphia Exhibition. Oscar Stonerhoff was the designer of the exhibit, and Ed Bacon worked with him on it. There were a series of important landmarks throughout the historic Society Hill area. The uh, Shep and Wister House on Locust Street St. Mary's Church and Churchyard with the grave of Commodore Barry, who was the father of the United States Navy. The Powell House, a very beautiful 18th century house at this place. And to the south is St. Peter's Church, where George Washington worshiped. And to the west is the First Presbyterian Church on Pine Street. These last two churches were in the center of handsome churchyards, which established a green belt on the south of the old city. I suggested a series of inner block park and footpath extensions centering upon and connecting together these principal historic structures, and to establish an open greenway to connect with Roy Larson's extension at the second bank of the United States. The idea was adopted by the National Park Service and is now nearing completion. Roy Larson's design for Independence Mall provides a transition from automobile scale to pedestrian scale. I extended the plan for pedestrian movement throughout the old city by the meandering pattern of the Greenway system. The plan includes a green breakthrough for a visual connection with the spire of St. Peter's Church. The first expression of this concept is the Delancey Street Park. These open spaces and the Greenway connections capture the influence of these fine buildings and pull their flavor deep into the residential area. And so we have observed a series of historical nodal points in the structure of the city. We've tried to give them a relationship, a firm foundation for future development. But the ideas and the plan languished, and the erosion of this beautiful but blighted area continued until Richardson Dilworth assumed the office of mayor in 1956. When our administration assumed office and reviewed the work already begun, we recognized the beginnings of a tremendous idea that could change the entire face of downtown Philadelphia. It was an idea that needed development, however, I suggested to the Planning Commission a four-point program, a most important point of which was the renewal of Washington Square East. This is the oldest part of Philadelphia, the place where our city began and where our nation was founded. If any place in the world was worthy of being rescued from decay, this was it. The Commission's preliminary plans were excellent, so good, in fact, that they indicated concerted action by every segment of our community. Philadelphia has been most fortunate in having many public-spirited citizens with vigor and vision in every walk of life who are ready to devote their time and energies to the improvement of their city. Shown an imaginative plan, but yet one capable of realization, they could readily see its potential impact upon the future of our city. Just one thing more was needed, a person of proven standing in the community, preferably a practical man of business, capable of translating the plans into reality. 
I therefore appointed as chairman of the City Planning Commission just such a man, Albert M. Greenfield. Renewal must begin in the heart of the city on a large enough scale to give assurance that the character of Center City breeds life into the whole city, to get scope yet detail, to augment the fine commission staff, to look to the magnitude of the program yet find answers to specific problems. We of the Planning Commission engage three nationally established architects, Messrs. Roy Larson, Oscar Stonroff, and Vincent Kling to draw a new and extended plan, enlarging the earlier projection of renewal of the historic old city. While the work on the planning phase was in progress, as commission chairman, I invited the participation of the leadership of our business, our financial, and our cultural resources to form the old Philadelphia Development Corporation a non-profit organization of men dedicated to the rebirth and renewal of this great city. Their job, to speed the redevelopment process. To outline this extended plan, speaking for his colleagues and himself, is Oscar Stonerov. Our assignment covered an area bordered by Broad Street, the Delaware River, Walnut Street, and South Street. And we divided this work among ourselves. Very early, we recognized the important relationship between Logan Square and Rittenhouse Square, with its surrounding residential neighborhood of the 18th and 19th century. And we felt a very strong connection between what we dubbed the Locust Street axis, between the residential neighborhood of Rittenhouse Square and the future residential neighborhood of Washington Square. Early in the assignment, we realized the importance of relating to an activity that had already begun a scattered but significantly determined renewal effort by individual citizens. My particular contribution to this design was the integration of the old with the new along a very carefully drawn line of demolition a small area close to Washington Square connected to a much larger one along the line of the river and Duck Street, seeking at this time a physical as well as a visual connection by way of a large opening under the proposed Delaware Expressway to a marina in the Delaware River. This was an early concept which developed into several variations later on. But one of the first steps in the realization of this redevelopment is now underway. The construction of Hopkinson House, a 36-story apartment building. Following the completion of this study, the Redevelopment Authority contracted to develop in more detail the plan for the eastern part of the old city area. To present the role of the Redevelopment Authority for us is its chairman, Michael von Moschisker. To the Redevelopment Authority falls the responsibility to plan in detail the new use of an area. To acquire the land, clear off the blighted structures, and convey it to the redeveloper. The authority is also responsible for finding homes for the relocation of families displaced by urban renewal. Conservation, the selective clearance of neighborhoods that have begun to show signs of blight, is another vital part of our work. Equally important is the revitalization of whole areas and utilizing them to their fullest. In Philadelphia, we have the largest urban renewal project in the nation, Eastwick. Here, private enterprise, Reynolds Metals Company, 
is engaged in building an entire new community. Imaginative planning has separated the automobile from foot traffic in this new community of 60,000 persons. Residential streets are dead end to eliminate unnecessary auto traffic. Each street connects with a tree-lined pedestrian esplanade, which residents use to walk to schools, churches, parks, and shopping centers. Pedestrian bridges span main intersections. Park-like areas border the walkway. It is a symbol of Philadelphia's determination to satisfy, within its borders, the cravings of its people and its industries for enough space and pleasant surroundings. Here, as in all other redevelopment projects, 1% of the cost of construction will be spent for works of art. Urban aesthetics have long influenced our plans for renewal. Following the Larson, Kling, Stonerov study, the Redevelopment Authority engaged architect Preston Andrade to develop the plan for the eastern section of the old city. His assignment was not to enlarge, but rather to enrich the design structure. This scheme was used as the basis for a great competition that was held to select a developer. Four groups competed, and the developer chosen to complete the eastern half was Webin Knapp. The man who created the winning design was architect Yo Ming Pei. As we study the Society Hill development, we found that the ground rules set by the Philadelphia Planning Commission and their consulting architects were really quite sound. As the areas of agreement began to define themselves, we concur in the decision to use towels instead of slabs. In this section of Philadelphia, we have a very unique silhouette, as determined by the slim towers of Independence Hall, St. Peter's Church, the Old Christ Church, and the Customs House. Our proposal defined the use of five towers, identical in design. The three towers in the easterly section will be set in a green and park-like setting. The North Tower will be put on the axis of a historic building, the Head House. The South Tower is placed on axis with the new extension of Locust Street, which will be developed with the project. The third tower is arbitrarily placed on axis with the new group of residential square townhouses to the west. The other two towers near the already green Washington Square are in a paved setting of truly urban character. We find these five towers firmly in place, set by the inference of design structure impinging on the area from outside the site. In a project of this scope, the interaction of various groups is an important consideration. As certain problems evolved, we worked toward their solution with the old Philadelphia Development Corporation and its executive vice president, John P. Robin. There is a natural temptation in public bodies, in civic groups, and business organizations to achieve immediate results, to be expedient. In this particular job, however, we felt then, and feel most strongly today, that quality, excellence, superiority of design is essential to true success. So throughout this job, we have tried to make sure that the paid towers would be actually accomplished on the site as presented to us. And during periods when it appeared that because of the admittedly higher costs of a superior design, this could not be achieved, we still stuck with the problem. 
And now, in our judgment, that problem has been licked. We find also that success in one project is the best guarantee of further success in projects still to come. The Department of Commerce, under the direction of Frederick R. Mann, proposed a recreation facility on the banks of the Delaware River in the downtown section and engaged the Ballinger firm of engineers and architect Robert L. Geddes to reestablish this area as a design element. In William Penn's original plan, the Delaware River was one of the great physical treasures of Philadelphia. Through the years, a series of finger-like piers replaced the pedestrian walkway. And in the familiar cycle, deterioration set in. As the result of a series of long-range public decisions, new cargo handling terminals have relocated the major port operation, and the original area can now be turned back to use as a public facility. Our problem was to propose to the city a framework for public action. The study was made a combined operation of an architect, engineer, economist team, and the result reflects a seamless process of decision. The first of the major public facilities gives a new visual edge to the city, a tree-lined promenade and a parking area along the riverbank. Connection to the city would occur at the foot of Market Street and also at the foot of Dock Street into Society Hill. The second public facility would be a boardwalk embarcadero, curving continuously for almost a mile along the edge of the Delaware River. With the provision of the promenade and the boardwalk, we felt that our cheapest land use would be open water and a series of water basins between certain piers that have remained in good structural condition. The piers that remain form the nucleus of clusters of activities to be developed by private builders and institutions. The most important of these will be a focus in the form of a tower marking the end of the major cross axis of the city, Market Street. To accomplish his role as an urban designer, the architect must participate as the engineering and economic decisions are being made. It is essential that the architect extend himself by making large-scale studies at the same time he prepares his small-scale sketches in order to understand the total setting of his design. In studying the whole of the center city plan, we made an interesting discovery. The spatial disposition of City Hall to Logan Circle to the Art Museum is virtually identical to the spatial disposition of City Hall to the Mall to the Port Tower. This may be merely an accident of history, but it does reflect on another basic responsibility of the architect. He must do in our time what is implied in past city planning, in past city building. The last of these design extensions was conceived as part of the 1947 plan and was developed in detail by Roy Larson. The interpretation of a plan, the carrying forward of its influence in the daily decisions of government is at least as important as the plan itself. This requires dedication by men of great sensibility and breadth. The City Planning Commission is fortunate in having just such a man as chief of its land planning division, Irving Wasserman. This final design extension is the balance to our continuity north of Market Street, which includes many historic buildings and interesting buildings in this area. A major focus is determined here at Christ Church which dates back to 1727. George and Martha Washington, John Adams, Robert Morris, and Benjamin Franklin worshiped here. A greenway extends to the west, where an approach will be made to the oldest friends meeting house in Philadelphia. 
past Benjamin Franklin's grave, and a final return of this pedestrian movement to the great plaza of Independence Mall. As we look forward to the future, we do so with confidence because of the work that has been done, because of the support it has received, and because of the leadership given to the City Planning Commission by its present chairman, G. Holmes Perkins, Dean of the School of Fine Arts of the University of Pennsylvania. The Home Rule Charter of 1952 placed on the City Planning Commission many diverse responsibilities. The most important of these is the preparation of a comprehensive plan. This has now been accomplished. This plan is far more than a hope for the future, for it has placed upon it an accurate price tag which permits its total completion within our own lifetime. A second major responsibility is the annual preparation of a six-year capital program which feeds projects into the process of government. This allows them to be built and financed on a flexible schedule. The Commission's interest, however, goes far beyond a purely functional and efficient arrangement of land use and buildings. We are equally concerned with the creation of an urbane quality of environment, preserving a human scale with space, variety, and beauty. We have worked towards these goals with many citizen groups and agencies who have vigorously supported the comprehensive plan. A noteworthy example of this vital cooperation is the Citizens Council on City Planning. To explain the function of this organization, let us hear from its executive director, Mr. Aaron Levine. We make every effort in Philadelphia to have the citizens participate in the actual planning and building of their city, stressing that human values must be preserved in large-scale operations. During the past seven years, citizens have worked very closely with the City Planning Commission on the capital program which is reviewed every year by citizen committees. To help the people of Philadelphia visualize the shape of the community in which they can live, work, and play, we have a permanent city planning exhibition, the Philadelphia Panorama. This exhibit is administered by the Board of Trade and Conventions. To detail the purpose of this project, here is the chairman, Lawrence M. C. Smith. Ever since 1955, the Philadelphia Panorama has been housed in the Trade and Convention Center, to which over a million and a quarter people come each year. This serves the city in three ways. First, it presents the image of Philadelphia to the great number of foreign visitors who come to see Philadelphia. Second, it tends to break down the jealousies and obstructions between the various surrounding counties and to create a feeling of interdependence in planning. And third, there are 30,000 school children from the parochial and public schools who come to this area for their social studies. They engage in actual planning tasks on a community level and it serves to get them ready to accept the plans of the future and to accept planning in their lives. The citizens who have had the opportunity to see this exhibit go back with new vigor and interest in developing a newer and better city. An interest that can grow to maturity only under a progressive city government. And we have this vision and leadership in our city council and in its former president, now mayor, the Honorable James H.J. Tate. We are today embarked upon a genuine program for a more beautiful and modern big city, which will at the same time produce the means to support it. This program is planned on a continual basis to increase our facilities, our level of employment, our payrolls, and our products and services. Every project in our urban renewal program must necessarily be approved by city council. This procedure requires study, discussion in executive sessions, patient attention at public hearings, and above all, leadership and vision on the part of our city council. 
Never in American history has the reputation of a big city changed so favorably as has Philadelphia's in the past few years. We are and should be proud of the new public image of our city. We should cherish this new image and seek continuously to live up to its high standards by all of the means within our power. The mature resolution of the Center City Plan is not the work of one man. It is the cumulative effect of the individual efforts of a great many people over an extended period of time, each one building on the work of the ones before. In definition and form, it begins to emerge as a total image, encompassing all of the projects developed thus far and outlining the projects which lie ahead. Now let the members of the City Planning Commission staff who worked on the plan present it for you. The Crosstown Expressway forms one side of the inner expressway loop, precisely defining the southern boundary of the original Penn Plan. Its depressed roadways have ramps directly connecting with the underground street system, serving a 6,000 car parking garage a great terminal point for automobiles which do not contribute to the confusion of the surface streets. We treat the automobile as an honored guest and cater to its needs. The Delaware Expressway has been designed under the guidance of Street Commissioner David M. Smallwood in relation to the architectural requirements of the historic area. Above Society Hill, it connects with the Benjamin Franklin Bridge and continues to the north. The Schuylkill Expressway extends north along the west bank of the Schuylkill River, past 30th Street Station, connecting with the Vine Street Extension and proceeds north. The project which completes the parkway the Parktown Place Redevelopment Project clears up a blighted section and marks the beginning of a park extension being developed along the east bank of the Schuylkill River toward a terminus at the Crosstown Expressway. Chestnut Street will become a gracious, comfortable pedestrian street reclaimed for the pedestrian by the removal of automobile traffic and the installation of light electric trolleys moving directly into the parking garages connecting with the expressway system. It will be landscaped to provide an attractive shopping mall in a very pleasant visual setting. The Pennsylvania Railroad commuter system converges at 30th Street Station and continues to the present underground terminal at Penn Center. The rail system is to be extended underground to a new lower level commuter station in East Market Street. From here, the tracks curve north to join the Reading Railroad, fusing the two commuter systems into one. The expressway systems move in toward the completion of the inner loop, with special ramps moving directly to the north side of the longitudinal core, serving a 3,000 car parking garage and a bus loop one level above the street. Beneath Market Street, the subway stations open into a lower level garden connected by a shop line concourse with a commuter rail station to the north, a proper entrance to Center City. At the street level, the shops are set back under building arcades with landscaped esplanades before them. On the upper level is the shopping promenade extending in an uninterrupted three quarters of a mile above the street. Glass bridges leading into the second floors of the five department stores link their seven million square feet of retail space into a single functioning unit served by every major means of transportation. This comparatively small but intense project binds together all parts of the plan into a cohesive whole. It is the three-dimensional system of space organization, a resolution of regional forces. This is not planning in the conventional sense, nor is it architecture. It is the form that should precede architecture, awaiting the designer's touch to bring it into life.
The challenge to the architectural profession today is to prove that it is capable of designing an urban environment worth the price it costs. In order to do this, its individual practitioners will have to take a new view of their separate efforts, and the profession as a whole must take a new view of itself. We must train men who can think in terms of broad design structure and who can deal with design problems at the level of government. Without a central design idea as an organizing force, the individual efforts under urban renewal will lead to chaos. With a central design idea, the creative energies of individual architects will be stimulated to new heights, and the result will be truly architecture.